a former governor of ours, Don Siegelman, has come to do a interview about his book on the Jeff Poor Show on WVNN. That's one of our sister stations up in Huntsville, and he actually has predicted that the uh, that the candidate for the Republicans is going to be none other than Judge Roy Moore. Now you may remember, and I've done segments on this before. Roy Moore has some kind of weird immortal streak. And for whatever reason, just when you think, oh, that's the end for Roy Moore, he's just going to ride off on his horse into the sunset, somehow he always comes back. And maybe Don Siegelman's right about this. I really thought that Moore had no chance when he ran the last time for Senate. But Siegelman comes back, and I'll just read some of the words that he said himself. One quote that was taken from that interview Frankly, I think Jeff is in trouble. He is being branded and has been branded as uh, by some Trump supporters as a traitor to Trump, someone who has turned his back on Trump. Whether that's just in Trump's mind or in all the voters' minds, it doesn't matter. I think it has hurt him. All right, so so far on his analysis, I don't find anything that I disagree with. Unfortunately, I've seen this firsthand that an awful lot of people who used to be session supporters now, because he got into a tiff, which was by no means his fault, with President Trump, I mean, when you, you mess with the orange god, you get the, the people coming out shouting blasphemy. And because of this, I do think that there is at least a, a portion of Alabama's voting base that sees any offense against Trump as an unforgivable sin, and they will never vote for that person again. I think that Siegelman is correct in that analysis. Now, how many of those people are out there? I'm not 100% sure, but I've got to tell you, it's not a small portion of the, the population. I have heard many, many people reflect a, an, a very anti-Jeff Session sentiment. But regardless of whether you stand on that, I do think that Siegelman's analysis is, is pretty fair th thus far. There's going to be a couple of things that he says in this interview, though, that I disagree with, and, and I'll try to break that down and tell you where he gets it right, where he gets it wrong, after I read the second part. This is Siegelman talking again. I do know this. Most of Donald Trump's voters were evangelical. I do know the constitutional amendment that passed in 2018 requiring that the Ten Commandments be posted in every public place received over a million votes in Alabama. And I do know that Roy Moore is, a, is branded as the Ten Commandments judge. I think Roy Moore has a silent Christian vote that is huge, and I think that they're going to come out and vote for him. This was a guy that gave up his seat on the Supreme Court because of his belief that the Ten Commandments. And you know, say what you want about Roy Moore, I think he has got a strong base. Okay, so there's a couple things that he's 100% right on. First of all, he's right about there being a strong evangelical core in Alabama. I mean, that's you barely even have to admit, to say that that is correct because in Alabama it's so incredibly obvious. Where your evangelicals are probably going to be anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of the country nationwide, in Alabama it's like closer to 30, 40 percent. I mean, th there's just a massive swath of evangelicals in Alabama, and it is impossible to win without that evangelical vote or at least a portion of it. And so I think that Siegelman actually is correct on that. I think that he's right that Moore has a freakishly devoted base. And a lot of those people also happen to be evangelicals. I think that he's confusing that a little bit in that all evangelicals are Roy Moore supporters, because I know a lot of evangelicals that don't really like Moore and didn't really like him in the last election either. So I think that he's conflating a couple of things there that ought not be conflated. But I do think that he's sort of on the right track. I will say this, though. One thing that I did uh, made me chuckle a little bit is where he said earlier there that he has a uh, a really silent base. No, Roy Moore doesn't have a silent base. He has a base. I agree with him on that. I think that Moore does have a strong, freakishly loyal base, but they ain't silent. I'm telling you right now, <laughs> a lot of those people, they are as loud and opinionated and will jump at any opportunity to tell you about how much they like Roy Moore. Now, maybe there is a silent base that I'm not aware of, and I mean, you know, who could blame you? They happen to be silent. But uh, as a general rule, the Roy Moore supporters that I've run into, be they Republican, Democrat, and, and yes, he actually has does have a, I wouldn't say a ton, but a decent amount of Democrat followers that just like his stance on things like the Ten Commandments. 
I, I, I got to tell you, they ain't silent. You could say a lot of things about Roy Moore's base. I don't think silent is one of them. So Siegelman mischaracterizing that, I believe. Uh, and just because a lot of those people happen to be evangelicals, there is an assumption that all evangelical voters are going to be in the Roy Moore camp. This is one of the reasons that a lot of students of modern politics, and I'm going to try really hard not to get too far inside baseball here, but a lot of the people who study modern politics get it wrong, especially when it comes to evangelicals, because evangelicals tend to vote as a homogenous block, but only during a general election. So when you're talking about evangelicals, they do tend to all vote the same way, but not in a primary. That's in general true when you're getting a, a Democrat versus a Republican. They tend to always pull the lever for the Democrat, which are, sorry, the Republican. But when it comes to the primaries, they tend to be kind of scattered. And without going too much into detail, the uh, Barna Group did a, a study into why that is, and, and they determined that only about 6% of the population are what they refer to as true evangelicals, and the others kind of claim evangelical. They self-identify as evangelical, but the truth is their, their lifestyle, their belief system is really not much different than other white voters that don't claim evangelical status. So that that's a fascinating study and I'm, you know, more than welcome to to revisit it and go into more detail a little bit later, but for right now, suffice it to say that that one of the things that Siegelman is messing up on here is he makes a mistake that a lot of politicians make in thinking that evangelicals are just a, a single solid voting block when it comes to Republican primaries. Experience has shown us that it is not. But uh, he is also right that a lot of those people that he's talking about, the people in the Roy Moore va base and the people in the evangelical base, he's also right that a lot of those people voted for Trump. So Don Siegelman, to his credit, you know, I, I think that he's a terrible guy and was a terrible governor, but I do think that he's an astute uh, observer of politics. And so I wouldn't discount what he's saying here lightly, but there's a lot here that he gets right. Now I'm going to tell you where I think that he goes a little off the rails here. First of all, he's completely ignoring the fact that Trump has denounced both of them. You see, in this analysis, Siegelman acts as though that Roy Moore is going to win because Donald Trump had a very public spat with him. And I think that that did hurt Sessions. Like I said, I, I agreed with that analysis that he started out with. But what he's ignoring here is that Trump also doesn't like Roy Moore. Trump has tweeted about Roy Moore, demeaning him. He has talked about how Roy Moore is a loser and how the Republicans in Alabama would be stupid to vote for him again. That's all, of course, a paraphrase. But Don Jr. has essentially said exactly the same thing. And you'll remember that after Trump said that about Roy Moore, his poll numbers started to plummet. I do not think that was a coincidence. And so what Siegelman is kind of ignoring here is that Roy Moore has also been bashed by the president. And the president has also said that he does not support Roy Moore's candidacy, just like he wouldn't support Jeff Sessions' candidacy. And so I see the two of them as kind of on equal footing when it comes to their status with Trump. Now, granted, the spat with Sessions took a lot longer. It was on a much larger stage because it happened on the national stage. So I think people are more aware of it, and it politically hurt Sessions more than it hurt Moore. But my overall point is, let's not pretend as though Roy Moore is the Donald Trump candidate, because while that may have been true in the last election after he endorsed him, that seems to no longer be the case. And because of that, I think that, that Siegelman is kind of ignoring that when he makes that suggestion, and he's also ignoring that many of those evangelicals blame Roy Moore for Doug Jones. They look at Roy Moore and say, this guy couldn't pull it out at the end, and that's the reason that we got Doug Jones, who is a nightmare of a senator. And because they do blame him for that, I think that the voters of Alabama, combined with several of the other factors that caused him to lose the first election in the first place, that they're going to look at Roy Moore and say, no thanks, we'll go with somebody else. I'm not saying that, that Siegelman's analysis is way, way off, but I think he's ignoring those two really important points of Trump having denounced both Roy and Sessions, and that he's also ignoring that a lot of those evangelicals, they still kind of hold a grudge against Moore because Moore is kind of the reason that Doug Jones is in office right now. I mean, 
virtually any other Republican candidate. Now, granted, a lot of weird stuff had to happen for Roy Moore to lose that seat. But virtually any other Republican in the state runs against Doug Jones and they win handedly. Roy Moore was the only one that was even capable of screwing that up, it seems like. And a lot of those voters feel the same way, and I just don't, don't think a lot of them are going to pull the lever for more. Now, you ask me that, what was it, about three, four months ago when he was leading in the polls? Maybe I, I gave you a different answer. But I think Trump coming out and publicly uh, throwing shade on Roy Moore really made a difference. And because of that, I think that I think that he's really missing the ball here. So let's remember too that Doug Jones getting elected definitely took a perfect storm. I mean, every single thing had to go exactly right for Doug Jones to be able to eke out barely beating Roy Moore in the the last election. That is true. But we also have to remember that the perfect storm had to happen, and part of that perfect storm that we're talking about was Roy Moore being his opponent. And the reason that Roy Moore was his opponent is because a perfect storm kind of had to happen for Roy Moore to be the nominee as well. Because you'll remember that what happened is we had Big Luther, who was seen as being corrupt, as taking a deal and taking that fancy Senate job so that the governor could not face the attorney general's wrath when it comes to uh, his affair with, you know, his assistant or secretary or whatever they called her at the time. Um... To, to avoid facing any consequences for his affair with Mason, he got rid of Big Luther Strange by promoting him to the Senate. Now, again, we can't prove that that happened, but it, the whole thing stunk and the Alabama voters didn't trust it. But the Washington establishment really wanted Luther Strange. And so what they did was they attacked the guy that they felt was the biggest threat to Luther Strange because Roy Moore was doing well in the polls and Luther Strange was basically neck and neck with him. So they tried to take out Mo Brooks so that Luther could get in that runoff and they figured if that runoff happened, well then it'd be fine and Luther would of course win the runoff. Now, I don't have to give you a rundown of everything that happened, but essentially what happened is that, long story short, Mitch McConnell ran constant attack ads against Mo Brooks to allow Luther to rise in the polls, calling Mo Brooks anti-Trump and anti-border wall and calling him a liberal, which is absurd. He's far more conservative than, than either of the other two that he was running against, Roy Moore or Luther Strange. But anyway, that strategy worked, and Luther Strange wound up in the spot against Roy Moore. The problem is Mitch McConnell did not count on Roy Moore winning that runoff. And so that perfect storm had to happen for Roy Moore to be the nominee. I'm not saying that he wouldn't have won it any other way. I'm saying that let's not pretend as though this just went off the way that it would have otherwise. I think that there's a very good chance that we're talking about Senator Mo Brooks, were it not for Mitch McConnell sinking millions and millions of dollars into that race. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. It, we'll, we'll never know. But if we keep that in mind that that was a perfect storm as well, I think that it puts into perspective how difficult a road to the nomination Roy Moore has. An even more difficult one than last time, where he had all this help because, I don't know, maybe, maybe we see Mitch McConnell look at either Bradley Byrne or Jeff Sessions, who's now entered the race, and says, you know what, I'd, I'd really like that guy. And so he puts millions of dollars into attacking somebody else, history repeats itself and, and they wind up in a runoff with somebody that's very damaged and Roy Moore winds up taking it. I don't know. I guess it's possible. But I just don't see that playing out exactly the way that it did the last time. Usually lightning does not strike twice, and that's true even politically. So I could be wrong here, but I think the fact that he's forgetting all of that really helps skew his analysis into a place to where it's not reliable. And before we go to a break, I do want to leave you with this thought. If Trump is your central issue, in other words, the approval from Trump and the guy who you're voting for approving Trump is the number one thing for you, and a lot of people would never admit this, but the truth is that's actually what they think. They use Trump as a litmus test, how much you support Trump. They equate that to supporting conservatism. And so because of that, they're going to look at that, and if they're going to just vote for whoever's the most pro-Trump, 
I think you got to go with Tommy Tuberville. I mean, Roy Moore had a very public spat with Donald Trump. Jeff Sessions had an even bigger public spat with Donald Trump. You've got Bradley Byrne, who they're going to be able to claim is anti-Trump because he does occasionally vote against or not vote with the president, even though the overwhelming majority of the time that he does. I mean, he was at the Alabama LSU game with him last weekend. So overwhelmingly, he's pro-Trump, but you could at least make the case. And a lot of these Trump loyalists that loyalty to Trump is the only thing they care about, they're going to look at that and say, I want somebody that just everything Trump does, they approve of. Well, if that's the case, Tommy Tuberville's your guy. Uh, Tub Tommy Tuberville has specifically marketed himself in this campaign as basically, I'll do whatever Trump wants me to do. And as frustrating as that is, let's be honest, in this state, it's probably not a bad strategy. So if you're going to account for this being pro-Trump vote being the main thing, if that's going to be your main issue, I think Tommy Tuberville probably winds up being your guy. And so it's interesting to me that Siegelman seems to say that there's going to be a, a large base of people that loyalty to Trump is the only thing they care about and then completely ignoring the guy that is most likely to garner that vote in that calculation. It just seems odd to me. Now, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, maybe he's wrong. We don't know. We, we'll find out on election day. But right now, I think that that's the most compelling case, that if you're going to be in the pro-Trump bandwagon, if that's going to be your primary concern, Tommy Tuberville is probably your guy. Hey, to make sure you get all the updates, you need to go ahead and subscribe and click that little notification bell down there. That gets you a notification every time I post a new Bible lesson or political commentary. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't subscribe, it's because you hate America and Jesus, but I can't think of any other reason you wouldn't subscribe.